my mic on? Can people hear me in the back now? Oh, it's coming on. Great. I think we, there we go. It's officially 140. Um, so uh, thanks so much for coming out. Um, I think we have an hour. And um, this talk is called ASP.NET Tips and Tricks. And so in the keynote this morning, I showed off a uh, bunch of services and a bunch of scenarios of, of stuff you can do in Azure. Uh, this talk's going to go a little deeper. And um, rather than kind of talk about uh, individual service features, uh, instead what I have kind of put together in this talk is um, a bunch of kind of what I kind of consider what I call tips and tricks that are more cross-cutting across Azure. So the good news is pretty much all these tips and tricks apply regardless of what you're doing inside Azure, whether it's VMs, whether it's web apps, whether it's microservices, whether it's IoT, whether it's data. And uh, it's basically a collection of stuff that generally when I even show it in front of a room of Azure experts that have used Azure intensively for years, uh, they always, people go, wow, I had no idea you could do that. Um, and so hopefully you find it useful and it can really help you be even more successful in the cloud. And basically the format we're gonna use is I'm gonna basically just cover the tip and trick and then dive into a demo. Uh, and so I think there's about 10 or 11 tips and tricks throughout here uh, that'll cover. And uh, again, try to make it as demo-centric as possible uh, and really kind of leave you with concrete things that you can go ahead and do. So this tip, first tip and trick is like a hidden gem that's been in Azure for about a year. And usually in a show of hands of people using Azure, I ask them, how many people have used this? And usually the response I get is, what is it? Uh, I didn't even know it existed. And so let me do a quick pull of hands here. How many people here have used Azure Advisor? Excellent, not many hands. That's actually not excellent, but it's good for the talk. Uh, <laughs> it's something that if you do anything on Azure ever, you should run. It's free, it's built in, and it basically is a trusted coach that can sit over your shoulder and tell you a whole bunch of things that you're doing wrong. And the four things in particular it'll help you do is build more secure apps, have them be more uh, highly available, so in other words, not having quality problems, get better performance, and then most importantly, help you save money. And so it actually will coach you on how to pay me less, um, literally. Uh, and so those four things are all great things. It's all free to run it, and um, it's super easy to do. So since it looks like only about 10% of people or 5% of people in this room have even heard of it, let's go ahead and show a demo of it in action. So basically, this is our Azure Management Console, um, and you might have a different console customized. We'll talk about customizing the, the dashboard in just a second. But what you all have is this thing on the left-hand side with a bunch of default service um, services in it, and there's this thing at the very bottom, or near the bottom, that we've added to every single customer's account, which is called Advisor, right there. And all you need to do is click the button. Uh, and what this basically will do is it launches uh, an analytics tool that will look at all of the, your Azure usage and basically customize a set of recommendations across availability, security, performance, and cost management that is tailored specifically to your account. So these aren't like generic best practices. This isn't like a PDF white paper you gotta read. This is basically looking at exactly how you are using Azure with your services and creating a customized curated list of suggestions on how to do better. And so for example, we can tell you, um, let's just get to the cost management one since this is the one that literally will help you save money. We'll basically analyze all of your application, your database, and your virtual machine usage. And we'll basically tell you, hey, you've you're not taking advantage of everything you could. So for example, I have a bunch of VMs that I'm paying $682 a month for that are way overused based on actually what's needed. And I can even go ahead and look at the specific usage pattern. And so here's where we've actually gone off and looked, and you'll see it takes a few seconds, but it's basically showing the last weeks of telemetry on this particular VM, what's its average uh, utilization rate. And you can see this thing is basically doing nothing on average for an entire week. And that's why we're saying you really shouldn't be running this as you know, a large VM that's costing a ton of money. You know, you're wasting it. And basically this advisor will tell you how to resize the VM. So if you want to keep it up, but just basically shrink it in size, uh, as well as how to shut down the VM. Uh, and then basically, it's similarly for all the other VMs in my infrastructure, it, it highlights, again, places where uh, you can save money. And if for any of these things, if you don't like it, the good news is you can press this little button called the snooze button. And when you do that, we'll basically say, okay, do you want us to ever remind you about this particular resource again? So you can say never if you never want to be told. Or if you say like, yeah, this is something I should do, but I 
don't really want to change my infrastructure in the next month because the holiday season's coming up, you just say, hey, remind me in one month's time, and then it's news, and that will basically remove this recommendation or any other ones we have from the list, and then we'll just add it back into the list in one month's time or whatever duration you basically specify. So this is basically on the cost management side. On the availability side, uh, we'll basically tell you where you have, for example, single points of failure uh, that you um, uh, don't have set up. So in other words, you're not using an availability set on a virtual machine, which means that potentially if that VM goes down uh, and you have like a load balancer set of VMs, they might actually be on the same physical server. If you set up an availability set, we guarantee that they're physically isolated inside our data centers gives you better availability. Again, you can click the link and it tells you all about how to configure it for that particular instance. Um, on the uh, performance management, we'll actually help identify places where, uh, as an example, your database is currently uh, consuming an awful lot of resources. Um, and so if you click on this particular link, it'll actually highlight, for example, something like this and take you into our database blade and in the performance management section, we'll actually look at your actual database usage. And so in this case here, we're looking at all of the application usage against this database. And this recommendation here, if you click it, it's basically calculated, you're not using parameterized queries right now inside your application, your query plan uh, doesn't enforce it. You turn on this particular recommendation, we've computed, you can basically reduce your CPU usage by about 22.56%. And then again, you just click the link here, and we'll show you the exact T-SQL script to run on your database in order to apply it. And basically, your performance will get significantly better on average about 0.7 seconds per query will execute faster. So again, all this stuff's built in. It's free. Um, and all you need to do is just run the Azure Advisor service in order to do it. And again, all these things are calculated based on your service. Uh, they're not generic. And so based on your telemetry, we'll recommend different set of recommendations. So highly recommend running that every week. How many people are going to go run it after this talk? Good. Um, and yeah, I just get in the habit of trying to run it you know, once a week. You can also download this as a CSV file as well as a PDF. And so if you do consulting for other people about Azure, what I highly recommend is run this on their subscription, take the PDF, replace our logo with yours, and you have a great written report of all the great things that you recommend that they basically improve on their service. Um, and uh, again, makes it super easy uh, to kind of make this con um, actionable and, and to be able to share it across teams. And the reason it's free is because we know if you follow best practices, you have a better experience. And if you have better experience, you'll be more successful and you're likely you know, uh, recommend and use Azure even more. So that's kind of tip number one. Uh, tip number two is related to it. And in fact, if you run the advisor service, uh, one of the sections I didn't click on was security, and it basically has, a, as part of that, you know, the main thing it'll tell you is how many security recommendations it has, and then it tells you to click a link, which will take you into this thing, which is worthy of a separate tip and trick and by itself, which is the Azure Security Center. Uh, and this is also a service that we basically make available for free in terms of a whole bunch of core capabilities, and it provides a way that you can scan your overall Azure environment, looking for places where you're not following security best practices, and will help guide you on how to implement them. And all that's free. And then it also has a bunch of other uh, paid features that you can turn on, specifically around threat intelligence. So in other words, we can tell you when you're actively being attacked uh, and how, and whether people are being successful. Uh, and then also some new capabilities, which I'll demo in just a second, we call just-in-time admin control, which is a really, a really great uh, security best practice uh, that allows you to kind of actually lock down all admin access to all your apps and infrastructure and basically only allow people to admin it when someone explicitly jits it or just in time uh, elevates. Uh, and it's a really good defense in depth security uh, mechanism that you can leverage. And what's great about the security center is it works with all your re Azure resources. It also works with a whole host of great security software from our partners. And so if you've got existing uh, solutions uh, or security vendors that you work with, you can plug it all in here. And this includes not just stuff that runs in our cloud, but also even stuff that runs in existing on-premise data centers. And so you can have a, a single kind of security center control plane in a hybrid way, regardless of whether you're running in Azure, on-prem, or even in other clouds. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. How many people here have used the security center? Excellent. 
no, not excellent, but it's good because you'll, you'll use it after I show it to you. Um, so let's go ahead and do a quick demo of the Security Center. So again, you can get to it by running the advisor and then clicking the security link in the advisor. The other thing is there's a dedicated link also on the left-hand side of Azure, which is called the Security Center. And if you drill in here, see right here, and you click it, it launches also kind of an experience. And again, rather than be generic security guidance, this is scanning your actual environment um, and providing a set of recommendations based on what we're actually seeing in terms of how you've configured your applications and what you have deployed in Azure. So again, this is all AI running on top of your actual system. And if you click any of these links, we'll basically show you, for example, we have 20 um, uh, compute specific recommendations or issues we found. And you know, this basically highlights exactly what we discovered and what we recommend. Uh, if you click any of them, you get details as well as the steps for how you want to go ahead and follow them. And so you can see here on my environment, I've got six of my 18 VMs that are in these subscriptions don't have anti-malware agents installed, uh, which means I can't actually detect if somehow I get breached and malware is on it. And so we're recommending put it on, turn it on. It's a free service uh, from us, and you can buy other uh, vendors as well um, and uh, enable it. You've got two of 18 VMs in this subscription that don't have a security system update. So in other words, an OS patch for security has been released and it hasn't been applied yet. Uh, it'll also detect cases where you've applied the patch, but you haven't rebooted the OS instance, and so it hasn't fully taken effect, which is something we see a lot of people often patch, and then a script will prevent the OS from restarting, and so even though they're patched, they're not secure. This will detect it. Um, one of the features we have now built in Azure, um, and, it's, and it's on by default for all new VMs, is called disk encryption, where we basically will do encryption at rest on all your disks. Um, so that even if someone broke into the data center, ripped out a um, uh, hard drive and ran out without the armed guards killing them, uh, they couldn't decrypt the disk to actually look at your content. And so that's a really good security uh, in-depth uh, approach, and you can even provide your own key so that um, no one but you even knows the encryption value of it. Um, so it's a free feature, you can turn it on, you can even enable it with existing disks. Uh, but because some VMs are old, a lot of people haven't turned it on yet. Uh, and so this is basically identifying 14 of my 16 VMs are probably were created with scripts a long time ago, uh, and they haven't had it enabled. I should go turn that on. Uh, we can provide you know, built-in baseline and vulnerability assessments that you can put on both your Linux and Windows-based OSs, which can help in the event that you do have a security issue so you can understand what's the baseline addition of your system. Again, you haven't enabled that. And you can see in this case here, bringing in um, data from a third party called Qualys, which is a security vendor that has done additional uh, agents that, that are running inside my environment. Notice how I'm sucking it in and I can actually see this in my single dashboard. So this will work, again, regardless of what different security vendors are out there. Um, and again, these are all not generic, but specific to my machine. If I click on networking, we'll then look at how you've laid out your network topology in all of the different network security groups uh, that are running as part of my system. And again, we'll do some analysis on it in terms of what we recommend you should be doing based on what we're certainly seeing. And so for example, in this particular case, I've got a couple of different issues. So I have a couple of internet facing endpoints that are wide open. So I might have SSH turned on uh, on my VM or I might have remote desktop enabled on a VM and that port is facing the internet and that's a security risk because someone could buy 100,000 passwords on the black market and then just start randomly trying to log in using the admin password on my VM, and they might get lucky and break in. And so that's one where we're saying, you should really lock down those internet-facing ports uh, and have only port 80 open, and then have all your admin ports only be on, say, a virtual network uh, that is private um, to your particular company or your environment. Um, we got issues here where we've identified, you know, you've got a network of systems. So maybe I have 20 VMs, and I've got a database, I've got a middle tier, I've got a front end set of systems. And what we've observed is you don't have any uh, network security groups, which are called NSGs, enabled on the subnets within that network, which basically means if anything inside your entire system were to get attacked and, and successfully breached, the person could basically move laterally and attack other resources on your system because you have no network isolation. And so what we're recommending here is you should really apply a network security group, which is free, so that, for example, your front end can only talk to your middle tier and not your database directly. Um, and you can isolate so that even if you were to be attacked, 
it isn't wide open once they find a weak link in your system, and you can basically block it. Uh, and you know, other kind of specific recommendations, again, are all based on how is the overall uh, network set up and how is it isolated and controlled. And you can see here I've got vanilla VMs in a lot of cases. I also have a Kubernetes cluster using our new AKS service up here. So we're, you know, it even works across both platform services as well as infrastructure services in terms of providing these recommendations. And you can do the same thing for data, for storage, as well as for your application tier. And everything I'm showing you here is free. Uh, so please use it because it'll make you much more secure. Some of the other things that we have, and, and a few of these, these next two things I'm going to show, or three things I'm going to show, uh, are paid features because uh, in some cases there's a lot of cogs involved or uh, cost involved for us to run it. Uh, but again, they're, they're great features you could optionally consider and take advantage of. They're not very expensive. Um, this first one here is called uh, security alerting. And what this basically does when you turn it on is it will monitor your infrastructure, not just for best practices, but for actual attacks that someone might be trying to do against it. Uh, and it includes a whole bunch of built-in mechanisms to basically warn you anytime we see uh, potentially bad things happening. And so for example here, and this is like subscription that I actually have a demo script attacking. It's not really that dangerous in my world. Uh, but this gives you kind of a sense of the types of stuff that we're actually able to detect. Things like SQL injection attacks. Um, this is a feature you can turn on on our database tier that'll actually look for any, what looks like anomalous SQL query patterns uh, going against your databases. And so if we see what looks like an exfiltration query that's running, or if we see something that just looks anomalous, uh, we can actually trigger using AI an alert and say, you might actually have a SQL injection attack in your application that's allowing someone to try to breach your database. And we can alert you. In this case here, this is what we alerted. Uh, and so in this case here as an example, um, if I click on this, it'll tell me, you know, here's the database that was impacted, here's uh, win, um, and I think even somewhere here, I have the right permissions. Uh, oops, I'm going crazy. Um, I can even see like, what it was the SQL um, script that was executed, so I can actually understand Oh, what just happened, um, and, and see it. You can turn on an agent inside your VMs, again, both for Linux and Windows, that will also, uh, we can detect and notify you anytime any system binaries are modified. This is also a, a, a signal that an attacker somehow got into your system and is trying to either put malware or move laterally. Uh, we can tell you when someone is doing a brute force password attack. So in other words, if we see a 1,000 passwords attempted to remote desktop into one of your systems, that's usually a sign you're under attack. The uh, best thing to do is turn off the ports so that they can't do that. Uh, but we can also tell you in cases where we think they actually not only attacked you, but potentially got in. Uh, and so you can see here, we're saying several remote desktop attacks were detected from free RDP, so much we're able to successfully log in. In the last 30 minutes, there were 60 failed attempts, 20 failed login attempts aimed at non-existent users, big signal. One of the failed login attempts aimed at existing users. And you know, so we're basically pretty sure that this is actually an attack that's happening against you. Um, again, this is sort of all early warning radar signs that you can leverage. Uh, and you go down this list here, you can see other things that look suspicious. Um, and you know, turning this on gives you kind of a really good early warning uh, signal. Everything that we show here doesn't just show up in this portal, because uh, the reality is we can't really bet on people always checking this. And so one of the tips and tricks I'll show a little bit later when I talk about monitoring is how you can also trigger automatic alerts uh, based on anything that comes here or anything that happens in the monitoring space around infrastructure so that we can send you either an SMS text message, we can send you an email, uh, we can also fire a webhook that can, you can either use the tech tip I showed in the uh, keynote where you can write a serverless code to do whatever you want, or we also have ITSM integration connectors with things like ServiceNow so it can basically, you can log a, a ticket inside your organization and route it to the right person. We also have integration with things like PagerDuty and a wide variety of other um, good kind of alert SaaS uh, capabilities um, that you can wire this up to to basically get uh, notification immediately if something's going wrong. Last two things I'll just quickly show. How many people here have locked down their administration ports uh, on any VM or app that they've ever built? Only one person's ever locked down their ports. Two, oh good, okay. We're, uh, something you might want to consider doing. Uh, um, and 
know, basically think about whenever you're building an app, you know, what is exposed from that app, uh, especially if it's internet facing, but even if it's in, interna, intranet facing, you also want to make sure you think through from a security perspective, what would happen if someone got on your network and started attacking the system? And be aware that if you have ports like SSH for Linux, which is 22, or you have the RDP port for a VM, which is a standard Windows port open, someone can always try logging in with random username and password guesses. And unfortunately, because there's only so many unique passwords in the world, uh, there's a high probability if someone tries 10,000 passwords that uh, for most typical systems, they will find at least one of those passwords that actually work. Um, and so you know, that's, that's a huge security issue. Uh, one thing that, that you can do is implement what's called a just-in-time access uh, pattern, which basically says not only should you have a good password that, that, that uh, is unique to that particular environment, but don't even let someone remote try to actually guess the password and be able to access the port 99% uh, of the time. And so don't even have the port exposed uh, such that anyone on the network can access it, except when you know you have to do some management operation and only someone from a trusted machine is able to configure and connect to it. And doing that on an intranet is actually pretty hard. Uh, because to change your network rules dynamically across your organization typically requires calling a different department, which is your networking department, asking them to change network rules, which are sometimes brittle, and if you screw up, can have massive impact. Uh, and so as a result, most people don't do it. Um, in the cloud, it's a lot easier to do it, and in specifically with this capability we call just-in-time access, which you can get through on the security center, it's pretty trivial to set up. And so as an example here, I could basically pick a VM, uh, let me pick a different one since I'm going to demo that in a second. I don't want to make, want to make sure if I lock it down that I don't <laughs> have to unlock it. Um, so I'm going to pick this one called Standalone VM. Um, it currently has management ports that are open, meaning there's still a password, but technically someone remotely can try accessing it using that open, well-known management port. And I'm going to basically enable what's called JIT support on that port. And so these are the management ports it has open. So it has port 22, which is SSH. It's a very dangerous one as well as some of the higher level ones here uh, open. And what I can basically do is for each of these ports set in place a policy so that by default it's always closed uh, and no one can access it. It will not ping, there is no way to connect. And instead what I can do is basically say only when someone needs to access it, then they'll turn open the port and I can lock it down to a specific IP range so I can make sure that only, for example, someone from my intranet can access it or only a particular developer workstation can access it. So not everyone on the internet will have access. And then I can also basically say, well, I want that developer who's accessing it to automatically close it when they're done. But I'm going to assume that that developer or that IT professional will make a mistake and forget to some of the time. And so I'm going to set a rule, which is I'm only going to allow it, let's say, 21 hours. Or I might even say I'm going to allow this thing ever to be open for one hour. And if the developer either doesn't renew the lease or forgets to close it, after an hour, automatically shut it down again. Uh, and now, no one can basically access this VM using any of those management ports, uh, except if they go through um, the Azure management plane and say, I want to request a one-hour grant from this IP address to do admin operations against it. We'll open the port, they're able to get in, and then if they forget to close it after that whatever period of time is configured, the port will slam shut. And now suddenly my environment is dramatically more secure because I don't have to worry, even if someone guessed my password, they still couldn't actually uh, get into the VM because the management port's not even accessible uh, for them to connect. So, uh, and what you'll see here right now, you can configure and open and close this from the security center. Uh, you'll see an update in the portal probably the next month or so where every time you click the connect button on a VM, uh, we'll actually by default surface the JIT experience so that you can actually JIT at that particular point in time or enable JIT at that particular point. Uh, such that you can then SSH or RDP in. So it becomes even easier from a workflow perspective to implement. The last thing I'm going to show on the security center side that's a pretty cool feature is something called adaptive application controls. Uh, and basically with this, um, this is another best practice that if you talk to a lot of security consultants, they'll definitely recommend you implement, but which it's often hard, frankly, in most organizations to implement today. Uh, and it's basically a whitelisting model of what is allowed to run on a particular environment. And so the practice that people recommend is, you know, basically if you've got an application running, say, in a VM, uh, rather than allow everything to run in that VM, 
basically say only these binaries, or potentially only these binaries signed by these company keys are allowed to actually launch and execute. And if anything else other than those binaries that are approved tries to run, shut it down or fire a security alert. And basically with this approach, you can actually go into Azure and say, I'm only gonna allow IIS, this process, this process and the script to run. And then if anything else gets on that VM and tries to run, it'll fire an alert or we can actually automatically shut down that process and prevent it from running. But again, it's a great way to prevent malware or hackers getting in your system. Uh, and um, again, a good defense and death mechanism that you can go ahead and turn on. So anyway, all the stuff's available. Again, it's all tailored and customized for your environment and all the prevention stuff is entirely free. And again, highly recommend in this day and age where security is happening, uh, is becoming you know, more and more business critical, definitely go ahead and check that out. How many people are gonna go check it out later? Hopefully more, good. Um, speaking of security, this is another one um, that not enough people take advantage of, and I have to confess, um, I was getting ready for a talk on Wednesday. I showed up uh, at the event um, and was running through my demos and hit a URL and ran into an issue where the demo environment that I was gonna show for one of my demos wasn't there. Uh, and it was returning an error of like 404. And it was even more confusing because it was in Germany and T-Mobile had a proxy and so I was getting some weird T-Mobile buy some new phone ad. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Um, and after a while, I thought, is there, yeah, is there a service problem? Did someone screw up? Uh, a few other people have access to my demo environment, and I went in, and I was about to send a mail and say, why did you delete this? I'm demoing it. Uh, and then I realized and remembered, oh, shoot, on Sunday, we were watching a family movie. I had my laptop. I was running through my demos, and I cleaned up a whole bunch of old demos that I no longer needed. And I went in the audit log and realized, oh shoot, I was the guy who actually deleted that environment, uh, even after I tested it on Friday to make sure it still worked. And I just made a mistake. I was going delete, 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 what's this? No, delete, delete, delete. And that what's this thing, I, I nuked. And thankfully I could recreate it and it worked out okay. But it's a, it's a prelude to why you wanna think about this, which is called rule-based access control. Um, and it's something a lot of people don't, um, take advantage of, including me, clearly. Um, and uh, if you implement it, it can actually save you on several fronts. It can both make yourself more secure, but it can also help you dramatically with that problem where someone on your team, uh, hopefully not you, um, deletes the production database because they were distracted and they clicked the wrong button and they thought, well, this is the test system and then only realize, oh my gosh, I just deleted the database. And I can't tell you how many times in a given week that someone calls Microsoft support in an absolute panic and says, oh my God, I just deleted our database. Can you help me? And in many cases, we can help you if you call us very, very quickly. Um, but you know, the thing we always try to do after we recover the database is remind them, turn this on so that random people on your team can't actually delete the database. That's really the fix, um, not uh, just trying to recover from that situation faster. And the best way to enable that is by turning on what's called role-based access control. This basically says instead of having everyone in your subscription effectively have godlike privileges, you instead lock down what can people do inside your team on a particular resource uh, using what's called roles to be able to control the access. And it's very, very flexible, so you can create any number of roles, and you can create really complex permissions, but it's also relatively easy to use because we have a bunch of default roles that we already pre-populate, and if you just spend a few minutes up front applying them, Again, you'll be both more secure and you'll avoid that problem of someone inadvertently changing something that they shouldn't have. And basically, the key concept here is there's what's called a role definition and a role assignment. And the role definition is like an admin or a reader role. Um, a role assignment is like, say, a list of names uh, that are applied inside each of them. And so I might, for example, have a owner role, which has full admin privileges. I might want to have a contributor role, which is someone who can't delete things uh, and can't change critical policies, but might be able to change simple settings. And I might want to have a role called reader, which can basically look at, say, monitoring telemetry, but it's not allowed to actually change anything in the actual environment. And those are three built-in role definitions we've created. And then all you do is you just map Bob into the owner role, you map Joe into the reader role, you map 
uh, Susan in the contributor role, and then when they're in the Azure portal, or they're using the APIs or using the CLI, they can only do the permissions for their particular role. And Bob, who's in the reader role, can't delete the database because he doesn't have owner privileges. And so if he either deliberately tries, it'll fail, but also, more importantly, if he accidentally thinks he's deleting or cleaning up a subscription, he can't inadvertently do that. Uh, and what's nice about roles is they also inherit down. And so you can set permissions at a subscription level in Azure, which basically says every resource in it picks up whatever role you, or whatever permission you assign. You can set it at what's called the resource group, which is a way to bucket multiple resources together, or you can assign it on an individual resource level. Uh, and so it ends up being kind of uh, fairly flexible in terms of how you can configure it and how you can use it. And then the cool thing here is anytime someone does anything, we also log it in what's called the uh, activity log, which I'll show in a second. And so you can basically see who did what and, and what permissions they were in when they applied it. So you can actually also audit after the fact uh, what's going on uh, when something happens. So how to take advantage of this. So I'm just gonna click on any resource. And this basically works with uh, almost every resource inside Azure. Um, and all you do is you basically open it up and you'll notice here on the top left, the third link is pretty much always called access control or IAM. And if you click on it, this will basically query our role-based access control system and show you who has permissions to do what on this particular resource. And so it's computing a whole large set of uh, different things and basically now showing me um, what roles are, are assigned. And so you can see I have an owner role. Uh, and so these sets of people have full control over this particular resource. They can delete it, they can resize it, they can stop it, uh, they can change critical security settings. So these are kind of the um, godlike controllers. And, I'm one of them. Uh, you can see what's called the contributor role. And so these people have ability to do some management on this resource, but they can't delete it. And they can't actually change a bunch of the critical properties, for example, security, on top of that. And so that might be someone who's doing development and pushing an app into a VM, whereas this might be a person that's actually controlling the environment. And then there's also a uh, role called reader and that person has no ability to change anything and has no ability to look at any secrets, um, but they can at least see whether the machine's up, they can look at the telemetry, they can look at the monitoring data, and that's sort of the role you ideally want anyone, uh, as, is mo most of your people in, uh, uh, certainly in a production environment situation. And basically, if you wanna add someone or change someone's permissions, it's really easy, you just click add. Um, and so let's go ahead and um, I'm gonna basically say, let's look at all my roles, and so I'm gonna take a reader role here, uh, and I'm gonna basically add someone into it, and I can name a group, or in this case here, um, I'm gonna pick Satya, who's our CEO, um, and there he is. Uh, I'm not gonna give him admin access, because I don't want him to screw it up, uh, and so I'm just gonna put him in reader role, which is a fairly innocuous, and I think I can trust him on that. Um, that's a joke, by the way, if you tweet that. Um, <laughs> uh, in case he comes back, he's like, what? Um, but you can see now he's been added as a reader, and if I scroll down here, he's now showing up in this list so I can see exactly what permissions that he has. Um, and that's how easy it is to add someone into that role. Uh, and if I want to remove someone, um, I just basically click it and hit remove, and they're gone. Uh, and I'll do that in one second uh, for Satya. Um, but I'll make, let me show one other thing before I do that, um, which is in addition, you know, and so the, the recommendation I'd have specifically is everything you have that's production-based, so anything that's, that's sort of, you know, business critical or that, that you have real customers going against, I'd recommend just going into the portal, click on this link, and literally look at who in your organization can do what to it. And by default, I see lots of people that have owners. And by, the, you know, and so if you're not careful, everyone in your team that has access to your Azure environment might be able to delete that system if you're not careful. And I think you'd be surprised how many people are in the owner and contributor role uh, versus a reader role in terms of your environment. So step one is just look at that for each of your critical resources. Step two is start removing people from the owner role and put them into a less privileged uh, account. One thing that, that you'll probably find when you start looking at this is you'll be like, well, how in the world does Joe have admin privileges? 
we, I never give them that. He's not even working on this project. And it's often because people have actually added someone as an owner to the subscription or as, a, as an admin up at the subscription level. And so he just inherits it by default uh, because the permissions inherit down. And so one thing that's useful here is you can actually see how did, for example, Annie get permission for this particular resource or how did Josh get permission to this resource. You'll see in both these cases they got permission because they have privileges at the subscription level, and so they just automatically inherited it down. And so the fix is to go into the subscription, remove them from having admin access, and then just add them to the individual resources where they do need owner access. And again, you'll make it a lot uh, um, uh, more secure. And you can then see, for example, in Satya's case right here, he has reader permissions, and he got it from this resource because I manually applied it here. He didn't inherit it. He doesn't have permissions anywhere else. So again, sort of a useful way you can also debug when you're scratching your head going, why did we give Satya permissions? And then if you want to get rid of permissions for someone, just hit remove, uh, and it takes a few seconds, and um, poof, they go gone. Um, and um, yeah, that's relatively easy to do. And then again, if you're trying to figure out why did someone get added or get removed and who did what, just go ahead and click the activity log, and you can actually see, for example, three minutes ago, I gave Satya permissions, and everything you do in the management stack inside Azure is um, uh, audited, so, and you can access that AUG, and so you can actually see here exactly who from what machine actually applied what permission to give them the role assignment, so you can, after the fact, debug it or look it up. Uh, and again, this is how, where, when that app that I accidentally deleted on Wednesday, when I'm sort of ranting to myself, going, oh, how could someone be so dumb as to delete it? I went to the activity log and realized, oh, it was me. Uh, and I was at home, and, oh, and I was, we were watching that movie, and it was 7 o'clock. And I realized, oh, can't send that mail to anyone now, um, because I'm the one at fault. So the good news is, you know, whenever something changes in the environment you can't understand, check the activity log, either at a per resource level, or as you'll see a little bit later, you can turn on and look at the activity log for all resources using the monitoring experience, which we'll talk about next. One other thing I'll just then talk about for the monitoring experience, um, it's a cool feature that's currently now in preview, uh, and so you can use it now. Uh, it'll go general availability probably in the next uh, uh, two months. It's something we call our Azure Policy Center. And so you might be asking yourself, as I'm showing some of these tips and tricks, uh, it's great that you have this tool that tells me when my disks aren't encrypted. It's great when you tell me that there's management ports open. It's great when you tell me that Joe has admin privileges to every resource in my account. Even better if you could actually prevent me from doing those things in the future and basically lock it down so I can't create a VM with open management ports. I can't assign Joe global privileges and I can't create unencrypted disks. And that's where this capability comes in. It's called the Policy Center. And what this is going to let you do, um, and you can do it now in preview, is basically create policies that you can apply to your Azure account, where Azure will enforce that whatever policy that you set uh, is honored through all of our management APIs. And so you can actually set a policy now which says, no unencrypted disks in my organization, period. And if you try to go into the management portal, if you try to run write code with .NET or Java using our SDKs, or use the Azure CLI or PowerShell and say, create a VM and oh, by the way, I'm gonna set the encrypted disk to false, we will block the creation of the VM and we'll return an error saying it's policy violation, here's the violation. Uh, and so this is, a, and we'll ship with a whole bunch of built-in policies that you can turn on. And this is gonna be a really good best practice that you can actually take advantage of to basically enforce uh, policies across your organization uh, that can help make you more secure. You, know, you can do things like you must always have backups on databases, um, you must always uh, uh, keep your audit logs for at least 60 days, et cetera. And um, you know, it's something to keep an eye on, and especially as you get into production and or are running more and more critical things, uh, a really good thing to take advantage of. And we've had some pretty phenomenal feedback from uh, companies, especially large enterprises that have compliance departments and are worried about uh, audits and things like this um, around you know, the, the flexibility and the, and the capability that this thing provides. Um, again, it'll be easy to turn on and it'll work then across the entire environment and uh, help you um, uh, make sure that, that you always follow best practices. So next uh, tip and trick, another kind of a good cross-cutting capability is something called Azure Monitor. How many people here have used Azure Monitor? 
Also only a couple of hands, okay. How many people here have used Azure? Okay, good, okay, good. Uh, I was like, ah, oh. everyone's like waiting for the TypeScript talk. Um, and uh, <laughs> I realized they're in the wrong room. Um, good, okay, so this is another one where, again, it's, it's built in, it's free, it works for all resources. Uh, and um, it's good that a lot of people haven't used it, so uh, hopefully you'll, you'll leave going, gosh, I'm gonna go check this out. And it's called the Azure Monitor um, system. And again, it's on the left-hand nav by default. It's called Monitor when you click it. And it includes built-in monitoring support for all Azure resources. Uh, it does automatic log and metric um, collection and provides a set of interfaces you can use to basically query your logs, query your metrics, and then importantly, set up alerts to get notified or take automated actions. And so you can actually use this to detect, oh, my VM is not responding, or I've got an application crash. You can trigger an alert to either tells you that that's happening, or you can even trigger an alert that says run this PowerShell script you configured to take some corrective action uh, to kick the VM or kick the, the application inside it if you wanted to. Uh, it also then has rich third-party API integration. So if you want to use things like Datadog or you want to use um, Splunk or uh, Sumo Logic or other kind of logging systems, you can basically pipe our logs to them. Uh, and you can also integrate with things like PagerDuty or ServiceNow for ITSM support and others. Uh, so you can again integrate across a wide ecosystem of stuff. Um, and rather, well, I guess I could show this and then we'll demo it. Um, and basically when you click on it, you'll get a blade experience like this. The activity log uh, is similar to what I showed earlier uh, just a moment ago with the role-based access control, but instead of the activity log for an individual resource, this is gonna show you all of the events for all your resources inside Azure. So it's a unified way you can see who's changed what or what's going on in my environment. The metrics view allows you to compute custom metrics uh, for any resource. Uh, that you want, so not just the built-in ones that are on the individual resource blades, but you can actually slice and dice them in multiple dimensions. Um, we have uh, new support, and you'll see it's called Metrics Preview, um, that lets you also do multi-dimensional metrics, uh, and so you can actually slice and dice metrics in multiple uh, partitions, which is a particularly powerful feature. I think we're still working on the UI to make that easier to use, but it will be super powerful once it ships. Um, we have Log Search, which I'll show in just a second, which allows you to write effectively like SQL-like queries against all your log telemetry, uh, which is super powerful for creating custom monitoring views. And then also on the networking side, we now expose uh, network packet trace information from a monitoring perspective. So if you ever see, for example, in a hybrid networking scenario where you're integrating on-prem networks to the Azure, uh, you can actually turn on a packet trace. And so we can monitor every packet that's flowing in and out of Azure to your environment and actually tell you exactly where, including on your on-prem network, packets might be getting dropped or getting blocked because of some rule or configuration you have in place. Uh, and all that's built in, and you can drive it all from the portal or the command line. And let's go ahead and play with that and take a look. So again, the pretty easy way to get this, it's one of these things on the left-hand nav, it's called monitor, uh, and it should be there by default uh, for all your subscriptions. Um, and basically when you, you, when you run it, um, I have permissions on this subscription. Oh, let's go. Oh. This is because Alan just shared his subscription with me. I'm like, what in the world is that? Uh, let me go to this one. Um, so you can, you can view on it on a per subscription basis. Uh, and um, the overview blade here will tell you any alerts that have fired by default that you've configured in your environment. So rather than just give you a maze of things to look at, we try to highlight here anything that looks like it's a critical alert that you've configured that's triggered. And right now you can see I don't have any. Uh, we'll talk about how you can set up alerts in a little bit. You know, simplest um, way to get started is to click on the metrics tab. And as I mentioned, you can use this to kind of slice and dice and look at metrics specific to your um, environment. So for example, here we go, a subscription here. Um, I could go and look at, if I got anything good here, um, I don't. this web app. Um, and so I can click on an individual resource here. If I wanted to look at, uh, you know, what's the CPU utilization of this serverless app? What was the average response time? You know, basically I can pick on any of these, you know, how many HTTP 200 responses did I send back? Um, well, it's dimmed out because I can't right now do multidimensional. Um, 
And anyway, I can basically you know, view this custom metric and kind of get a sense of you know, what has the health of this service been like over time. Two things to take a look at, and we'll talk about in a second. One is you can click to add an alert. So right now it's saying no alerts were configured for this particular app. If you click on this, we'll walk you through a wizard where you can say, hey, if the CPU ever, if the response time ever went above five seconds, alert me. And then that would actually uh, uh, fire off what's called an alert. And then you could route it so we email it to you, we can SMS it to you, or we can fire a webhook to let you actually know some action might require um, you to take um, steps, and so that wizard will walk you through. And then the other thing that uh, is kind of cool about this view is, you go ahead in the top right, you'll notice there's little, this little thing called pin to dashboard. And so any of the views that you create in monitoring, if you click pinning to the dashboard, and then go back to your overall dashboard, you'll find it will actually show up on your dashboard home screen. And so you can basically take snapshots of what are the critical things that you want to go ahead and uh, keep an eye on. You can resize any of this stuff if you want to, and you can also then drop, drag and drop it to be wherever you want from a UX perspective. And now I can actually see how is my serverless app doing, and I can say, well, it's weird that it would spike to 3.5 seconds. I want to figure out what, what happened then that caused it, and then I can click to drill into uh, it in more detail. And if you click on this, I think this actually will deep link you back into that experience where you can customize it further and or trigger an alert uh, to do more investigation of it. So that's just around the metric support. You know, other things you can do in monitor, as I mentioned, you can do the activity log for everything. Um, you can do network watcher for package management. Um, you know, for all the alerts, uh, I can see, for example, let me see, Corey probably has an alert. Um, you can see here I have a TCP failed alert uh, that I've basically configured. And if I go ahead and click edit on this, you'll see basically what I have here is a metric populating it, uh, basically it says if the value is greater than 100 over the last five minutes, then go ahead and notify the owners, contributors, and readers. And again, I can do it by email. I could do a webhook that I call. So for example, I could paste in PagerDuty, or I could paste in some other notification system that will route to the appropriate engineer that's on call. Um, or I can actually say take an action and actually run a script uh, with any custom logic I want when this alert triggers. And I can do that across any metric across Azure for any resource that I want. So again, pretty easy to go ahead and configure alerts. And then the super powerful thing uh, that you should definitely check out is that log search capability. And so this is gonna load up um, simple view that you can do quick interactive log searches. Uh, and you can either do it in this text box and hit okay, or the thing I really like is this link called advanced analytics, that if you click, will deep you, link you into a custom log analytics uh, service that we provide uh, that'll take, basically take all of your metrics and all your log telemetry and pump it into a database that you can then go ahead and do interactive queries against to be able to slice and dice any bit of information that you wanna see. What does that look like? So, um, and there's a whole bunch of like getting started videos and things on here, which makes it easy. So let me just show you a couple examples of kind of how powerful this stuff is. So. How many people here have a log telemetry system that they use today? It could be like system diagnostics inside .NET, or it could be something like Kibana or Logstash or Hadoop, where you cap capture a lot of your production telemetry into to be able to look at after the fact when something goes wrong. Um, and, uh, and your system diagnostic write calls could ultimately go to a log file that then goes into that system. Uh, you know, the downside with that in an on-prem environment is it's a lot of work to set that thing up, and it's often has to run on a lot of machines. And you know, taking the logs and pumping it in there also sometimes can take a few minutes. And if you've got a problem in production, you really want to get the answer fast when something's going wrong and be able to identify what the problem is ASAP. Um, and that's where this thing comes into play. And so the nice thing about the Azure Monitor system is we can pump all your log telemetry, all your metrics into effectively a giant queryable database where you can write custom queries against it and execute it in seconds. Uh, and so we actually guarantee that within 60 seconds of something happening in your app, the data is available to be queried in the log system. Uh, and we pump in a lot of data per day. As an example, just our internal Microsoft systems, we pump in about uh, four and a half petabytes of log files every single 24 hours. Uh, and every one of our engineers for their services can basically query that. Um, so you can literally pump in trillions of events. 
And so it's just an example of this. I'm going to write a simple query here using uh, this tool. And it's sort of a SQL-like dialect. And so I'm basically saying, uh, bring me back every bit of perf data over the last 90 days and give me the count of how many total events have happened. And so I'm going to hit run. This is not a pre-computed query. We're actually calculating this in real time. So I'm effectively scanning the log system. And you can see I have over the last 90 days for my environment uh, configured and stored 1.4 billion individual perf data metrics uh, that are available for me to look at, which is a lot of metrics. Um, and then what I could do is I could say, OK, you know, what are these types of metrics? And so I'm going to write the second query, which is basically going to count by aggregate counter value uh, and basically bucketize it. And you can see here now, here are all the different types of metrics. What's the count and what's the average counter value across all the data in those 1.4 billion rows? Uh, and so I'm basically now slicing and dicing this data again in just a few seconds. And then where it's really powerful is I could do something like this where I can basically say, OK, now look at the last seven days. Let's look at the processor and processor time for all my systems and then summarize the average value and then bin bucket by time generated in a one hour increment. And then rather than bring it back as a table, render it as a chart. And so it's a pretty concise syntax. If I go ahead and run this now, and again, this is all doing it in real time um, as we're writing the queries. This is now going to render a visualization for me uh, that shows me all of my processor usage over the last seven days in one hour bin buckets with average consumption by resource type. Um, and again, you can write and slice your own queries just like this uh, and effectively execute it in real time. Uh, and this works with billions or petabytes of log telemetry. It also works with a few megabytes of log telemetry. So, you know, it's, it, and it's, you're not standing up any VMs. You're not having to stand up your log system. Uh, basically, you just pay by the amount of log data you want to store and how long you want to store it. And we provide this query engine for you. And just like I showed with the metrics view, you like any of these things, great. Go ahead, oh, go ahead and pin it to your dashboard. And so this is a great way you can create a dashboard of all the different custom views that are specific to your application. Click on it, dive deep, and then you can immediately uh, troubleshoot what's going on in your environment using real telemetry that's all um, no more than 60 seconds uh, old uh, in terms of how your live production environment's running. And again, you can dump your own custom values in here. So if you've got, for example, system diagnostic calls in .NET or you're doing console.log writes in Node.js, they'll show up in the system as well. And you can go ahead and actually query across your custom schema plus all the built-in metrics inside Azure as well. So definitely worth checking out. Um, and you know, relative from a price perspective versus what other cloud vendors or versus like say a Splunk or Sumo Logic, our cost for log telemetry storage as well as querying is sometimes 50% less uh, than anyone else on the market. Next little tip and trick, custom dashboards. So I've shown you how you can pin tiles onto your dashboard um, where you have custom monitoring views. And you know, hopefully you've found, we're trying to make it discover about how you, know, you can add things to the dashboard like resources and you can click to delete them and resize them and do a bunch of stuff. But we still see a lot of people that you know, haven't really customized their dashboards in deep ways. And um, if you're using Azure a lot, uh, or even a little, um, I highly recommend you spend a little bit of time just sort of setting up your dashboard however you'd like to uh, configure it, uh, because it can make your operation life a lot easier. And uh, two little tips and tricks with our dashboard. One is you can actually put a part in here that's custom, where you can actually put any markdown you want in your dashboard. Uh, and actually render images, you can render text. Uh, and so it's a great way that, again, as you're in a team environment, potentially you want to have a dashboard for operations. You might want to have the links to the wiki pages for what does this report mean, or what does this chart mean, or what should I do when it's read. You can basically customize your dashboard to specifically have whatever content you want. Again, you can see you can resize things, uh, you can delete things, uh, you can move them all around. And then the real hidden gem that not enough people realize is you can have multiple dashboards. So how many people here have multiple dashboards? Good, a few people have. But again, a lot of people haven't. And so you're going to go, what is a multiple dashboard? So here's the trick with a multiple dashboard. You basically click this link called New Dashboard. 
And you could say, this is my NDC production dashboard. And it's blank. And what I can then do is I can click on you know, any resource that I care about. So I'm just going to pick on a random one here. I can then go and pin this to that dashboard. I could pin a couple of monitoring views to that dashboard. And now, hey, I've got a custom thing specific to NDC. And again, I can you know, tailor it however I want. And then when I want to go back to my normal day, I just basically toggle back to the previous dashboard, and I'm there. Uh, and then if someone, you know, I see an alert that comes in on my pager and it says, hey, something's wrong with this production app, just toggle immediately into it and say, hey, we're seeing a latency spike. I wonder what's going on here. Click into it. You know, you've got that custom log chart that shows you the telemetry data and all the events that have happened in that period. Click link into it. And you can now immediately start actually diving into kind of a particular live site debugging session. Um, and have every, all your views and all your telemetry basically set up to view. And then when you want to go back to your core development, just toggle back into um, uh, you know, a different uh, view, uh, and it'll basically uh, show up and take effect. You can also then go ahead and share your dashboard. So if you have a team of people, you can also go ahead and uh, have other people view the same one. And then the full screen version is kind of nice because it hides all the browser Chrome. And the reason we added this was specifically so if you're in a team environment and you have a heads-up display where you want to have in the hallway or in an operations room, uh, like a flat screen monitor that shows you the health of your system, basically just create a dashboard. Please make it read-only. So if anyone walks up and then takes the mouse and uses it, they can't delete your database. Um, so that's a tip, make it read-only. Uh, and then just go full screen. And then that way you have effectively a heads-up uh, display that you can basically use to track your progress. So really easy way. Again, to use dashboards here to get kind of exactly the information view you want and the combination of being able to do that, you know, uh, with the monitoring, security, and best practices uh, makes life really easy. Who would like to save money and reduce the amount of money you need to pay on cloud computing? Great. Uh, so that's where these next couple tips and tricks come into play. Uh, this is a great one. This one here you can only do with Azure. Uh, and it basically is a way that you can run Windows and Microsoft workloads far cheaper uh, than any other cloud out there. Uh, and it's with something called the Hybrid Use Rights Benefit, uh, which is a program we have in place. It's a really awkwardly named program. Um, and it basically allows you to reuse all the existing Windows Server licenses you already own. And so there's a good chance if you work for a company uh, that has on-premise servers, you've already bought Windows Server licenses. You paid the money for them. And chances are you have what's called software assurance, which basically means you get the rights to keep upgrading them uh, without much money. And if you do, and you want to turn off a computer that's running a license, you can go up to Azure and just reuse that license. And we'll drop the price of your VM by upwards of 40%, uh, sometimes 50%, um, uh, for that workload. Uh, and basically all you need to do is when you're creating a VM, and you can do this also from the command line as well, um, when you go to create it in the portal, you fill out a bunch of stuff. At the very bottom here, we have this UI here. We used to call it, do you want to enable your Azure hybrid use rights benefits? No one clicked it. And so we renamed it Save Money, and now lots of people click it. Uh, <laughs> and basically, it just says, hey, you can save 40% with the license you already own. You already own it? Yes. Just confirm that you've read the thing, that you really do own it. Click check, hit OK, you're done. Uh, there's no PID, there's no, you gotta re-image your system, there's no, you gotta upload the license or talk to anyone from Microsoft, it's the honor system. Um, you know, if, if you say you have a million licenses, we might call you. Um, uh, but, yeah, you know, basically, you know, there's, there's no like enforcement or, or, or re-imaging you have to do, you basically just tell us you do have one, you click it, and we automatically lower your price on a per minute basis. Um, uh, again, by 40%. So great thing to take advantage of if you got any existing Windows Server license. It also works with SQL, it also works with SharePoint, it also works with all your Office servers, um, and it's something that only works on Azure, uh, and so it's a great benefit to be able to leverage and take advantage of. In addition to allowing you to do it for things like VMs, we're also enabling you to do it going forward with things like SQL databases, not just with SQL databases in VMs, but you're gonna be able to take your SQL licenses that you've bought in the past and be able to apply them to SQL database as a service offerings as well, uh, so that you can also drop that and, so, and run it and have all the benefits of 
uh, more of a managed services offering versus just an infrastructure. So that's one definitely to take advantage of. Uh, the other one to take advantage of that's now available and in general availability use is reserved VM instances. Uh, this allows you to drop your price sometimes as much as 70% uh, over what you typically pay. And basically the way this works is if you are going to run a VM and you're pretty sure you're gonna run it for a year or two or three, um, and it's not something you're gonna turn off in the next hour or the next couple of days, you can basically go into the portal and say, I wanna buy a reserved instance, and you can indicate how many VMs you want. And so let's say you have 10 VMs, five of them you're not sure you're gonna use, but, but five of them you're pretty sure you are for the next year or two. Buy a reserved instance, we'll lower for five of those, say buy five reserved instances, we'll lower the price by upwards of 70% on the VMs. Um, and um, uh, you, you pay some upfront money for the reserved instance, but then it basically lowers the price and it ends up being about a overall uh, depending on the VM size, 50 to 70 percent perform uh, cost reduction um, as part of it, and it's it's very flexible. Um, we have some nice benefits that 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 uh, other cloud vendors don't have, um, and so you can actually reuse them, and you can pool them, and you can you can um, resize them. And uh, again, it's super easy to turn on. And if you're running a system in Azure, you've got a lot of VMs. Definitely recommend looking into it because it can probably lower your bill quite a bit. That's where I think this will be my last tip and trick because I think I end 60 seconds ago, right? Yes, okay, so we'll do this one quickly um, and then we'll call it a day, which is Azure cost management. And this is another cool feature that if you're an Azure customer, you now have for free, but again, a lot of people don't know about. Um, and it basically uh, takes advantage of a, a company that we bought this past summer called Cloudin, which does cloud-based cost management. What that means is they can take your uh, bill from Azure and so we have a billing API, and they've built pre-built reports and analysis, which allows you to slice and dice your bill and understand what resources you're using, where can you resize resources to save money, uh, what projects are you using it on, uh, and if you use things like tagging, you can even inside a large organization, we're using Azure for many things, you can even pinpoint, is it dev test are we spending money on, is it project one versus project two, and it even has internal chargeback and budgeting capability, so that, again, if you're a large organization or even if you're a small one, you have lots of different projects, you can have one bill and then you can internally charge departments uh, based on their actual consumption uh, in a really easy way. And the great thing is it's free um, and it's built into the product. And so to take advantage of it, you just go and you click on cost management uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, click on this cost management blade and link into this. I'm on an internal subscription, so I'm gonna to need to quickly uh, log in to a different subscription, just because my standard demos uh, don't cost money because I own Azure. Um, so, good tip. You're also gonna see like the extreme security benefits of owning Azure, which means I have to do face ID to log in. So bear with me one second as Validates who I am, boom, I'm logged in, good. Uh, and what you'll see in a second here is the standard experience you'd get when you click that link inside uh, the portal experience um, and network willing. Uh, this basically is gonna show you the cloud in tool. So over time you'll see this integrated directly in the Azure management portal. Uh, but right now it's a separate browser uh, because they were separately a different company. Uh, and this is basically now analyzing all of, our, all of my usage. And so I can see, for example, all my VMs over time, what families am I using, how much am I consuming. I can look at utilization of my VMs. So not only can I see what are the VMs that I should turn off because nothing's happening, but I can actually see, hey, I have a whole bunch of VMs that are only using 25% of my usage. Let's go resize it. I can look at by department um, and budget you know, which department and projects inside my organization are costing what uh, um, consumption. And I can even set budget thresholds. So if a project says, hey, we're gonna use uh, 400 pounds worth of uh, cloud consumption over the next six months, I say, okay, 400 pounds, I can get alerts and I can actually model based on their consumption, are they gonna go over, under um, all that detail? And for any of these things, I can basically uh, go ahead and drill in. Um, this is sort of like the funkiest view I thought I'd show. Um, do this one first since this is the easy one to understand. Um, 
slower all of a sudden. Um, and so this one right here is just looking at instance utilization over time. You can see here you can do lots of filtering and slicing and dicing. Again, this is just showing, hey, I've got resources. These are all the ones that are 0 to 25% use, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, stuff that's more max. And I can now sort of say, oh, wow, who, who has all those VMs that are underused? I can kind of drill in, oh, there's 83 of them. Um, and I can basically use this report to get the listing of exactly which ones they are and who owns them. I could even go ahead then and look at by technology or by whatever tags I want to put on the resources. And so I want to see how much am I spending on, um, let's say, ETL workloads inside Azure. Um, I can actually see the infrastructure that's tagged ends up being about $3,000, which is 3.8% of my spend. And I can actually see how much of this production versus dev teps versus which particular project. And so this is sort of, again, a nice view that helps you understand where you're spending your money. And then the goal is you can optimize it and help save even further. Um, and again, if you're an Azure customer, it's completely free, all these reports and all this analysis, um, regardless of how your Azure subscription works. Uh, CloudIn is multi-cloud management, so you can actually use it with other clouds as well. Um, if you're an AWS customer, uh, it can also be free if you move your workloads to Azure. Um, <laughs> you can also pay to get uh, your, your AWS workload managed as well. Um, CloudIn used to charge for Azure as well. When we bought them, we decided to make the Azure uh, uh, features entirely free. But the nice thing is if you are multi-cloud, you can also take advantage of this uh, to optimize all of your cloud providers' bills um, and be able to use them even more effectively. Last thing I'll just mention before I get ripped off stage uh, is anytime you have a problem with Azure, one of the things I highly recommend you do is use the monitoring to try to understand it, but if you can't figure it out, click this Diagnose and Solve Problems link in the top uh, left. And we do a couple things as part of this, uh, which will help. Uh, one is we now have what's called Resource Health Check on most of our resources. It's available at the very top. This is giving you a real-time signal as to whether Azure uh, thinks there's anything wrong with this particular VM or resource. And so we're actually looking at the real-time monitoring view coming off this server node, this top of rack router, and this part of the data center. And this is a good signal if you think there's something wrong and you want to figure out, is it my app or is it Azure? Check this link first. This gives you a sense of what's changed. You can see those three role assignments where we added Satya and removed them. I can see who changed what. And then go ahead and run through these recommendations on how to basically troubleshoot your issues. We try to keep updating them with what are the most common things people call us about. And again, if you have a problem you can't get it fixed, click Support Request, and this will automate uh, submitting a support request ticket to us so someone can call you back and get help. Um, and so again, anytime you have problems, that's sort of the blade to look at. And what we generally find is people that actually go through the um, diagnose and troubleshoot section, about 80% of the problems can be fixed by these top five or seven links. And we have tools that you can now run for most of them to help diagnose and figure it out. And so hopefully that can help you in the future. So I think I'm over, uh, so I need to wrap up now. But hopefully, it sounds like from the tips and tricks, there's a lot of stuff here that might have been new for people, even that have been using Azure for a while. Um, pretty much all this stuff I showed, uh, for the most part, is either free or doesn't cost much to use at all. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully it allows you, and it works with pretty much every uh, resource type in Azure, and so hopefully it makes you even more successful as you do your cloud-based development, and uh, hope you're very successful, and um, uh, look forward to seeing what you build on Azure. So, thanks a bunch. <laughs>